The talk I'm giving you is about gardening, really, <laughs> not farming. I don't know how many of you are farmers intrigued what gardeners get up to. I grew up on a farm of 1,000 acres in the 1970s, early 80s, and um, then was at university and got interested in nutrition and uh, became a vegetarian, much to the scorn of my father, <laughs> rabbit food. And so I'm from a farming background. I'm very aware of how farmers and gardeners don't really talk to each other or have that much common ground. Uh, in the 1980s, when I was doing organic market gardening on eventually seven acres, I was still very much a, a grower. That keeps you in the sort of that gardening substrata almost. And, and we always felt a little bit in awe of farmers who had, seemed to have much more money, big machines, that kind of thing. And we, we formed the Organic Growers Association in about 1984. And that always was a bit in the shadow of British organic farmers. And then it, both of us actually got gobbled up by the Soil Association in about 1989 and ceased to exist. And ever since then, I've kind of kept out the loop a bit of um, associations and done very much more my own thing. Uh, because in the 1980s, even though I was organic, there was not much interest in soil and certainly not in no dig. So that, that's one thing that's really changed. And I've always been no dig, but didn't really talk about it very much until I brought out my first book in 2007. And then it's been a steady upward curve since then with the soil. And this is where it's come to with understanding the soil so much more. And it's actually great to be in the fungi tent. <laughs> so, so um, you know, until recently, when I started market gardening in 1982, that People were saying things like, you know, scientists would say <clears throat> mycorrhizal fungi do not work with vegetables or, you know, field crops, basically full stop. And because they were scientists, everyone believed them. And since then, I have come to have a bit of an issue with science, how it's not science itself, but how it's generally understood and used. And, you know, again, going back to the 80s, it's good to have a bit of a sense of history for all these things because you see how we got to where we are. Margaret Thatcher, <clears throat> you know, she kind of abolished ASDA. I know the name st is still there, but uh, in those days it was government funded <clears throat> and you could get answers to questions without commercial background. <laughs> and then she introduced what was called, became called market-led research, and that's pretty much what we got, which means the research that's being done has a market, an interest, a commercial interest. And we're not getting unbiased research from a lot of scientists in my view. I might say a few things today that slightly offend some people. I will, I'm not going to apologize because I, you know, I feel I'm old enough to got the experience that I can <clears throat> have this perspective and, and, and also not be afraid that someone's going to suddenly end my career by, <laughs> because I said something slightly outrageous. Um, so yeah, with science, I, I think we've got to, you know, take it all with a bit of skepticism. Just because they're scientists doesn't mean they're, they're correct. Okay, so in practical terms, I'm actually cropping on just over a quarter acre now, taking on some new ground. And what I'm doing, to give you the background, is, is, is um, producing vegetables, mostly salad leaves, because that's the only vegetable really you can grow to, to get, <laughs> have a small profit, and doing it very intensively. So I've scaled down from what I was doing in the 1980s and done a few other things as well. And now, <clears throat> producing actually a lot of food on, on quite a small area using no-till, very intensive methods, where I'm putting on mulch on the surface only once a year, and that can give me two crops a year. So very much of the understanding that the, the application of compost is not fertilizer, it's not about providing extra nutrients, although it does that a bit, it's about stimulating the soil biology to make that food available, the food that's already there and so I'm only needing to put the compost on once a year, even though we're doing two crops a year. That's a big time saver. A lot of what I'm doing is about being the most efficient and time saving. When I started market gardening, I went around a lot of market gardens. That's how I did my learning. I'm really grateful I didn't go to agricultural college or anything. I just learned on the ground. And what I observed was these guys were fighting the weeds and they did not have time to look after their crops. You know, you've got to harvest the carrots, you've got to find them first, that kind of thing. It wasn't always that bad. But it really struck me that there was something that were out of balance here because the weeds were so, such a problem. And 
I didn't know at the time that no digger would result in so few weeds, but it means, for example, this second cropping is so quick and simple. You've got no ground preparation, you've got hardly any weeds to clear. You're just clearing one plant, putting in the next, and that's going on all through the season. So it's keeping the ground full. I don't grow green manure as much or hardly at all because we're cropping. <laughs> I want to grow vegetables. And the fertility is coming from the compost. So this is where it's different to larger scale farming where you would be using cover crops and you're, you're not intensive cropping in this same way. But the principles, the background principles are very similar. And that's what the garden looks like. Well, that's quite a recent one actually. So that's the first crop. So everything that's in that picture is first plantings, things like broccoli, early cabbage, cauliflower, lettuce, spinach, carrots, beetroot, all of those are first stage half season crops. A lot of vegetables are half season crops and so then we're actually coming up to a really busy time now where I shouldn't be here at all, I should be back <laughs> clearing and replanting, but that's where summer's a really busy time, uh, particularly July, uh, first half of August, where we're, we clear by twisting out plants, put them on the compost heap, break them up into smaller pieces if they're quite large, uh, making a lot of our own compost, I'll mention that in a minute, and then the, the mulch that's on the ground, so it's a little bit of wood chip on the paths, about three centimetre, and similar amount of compost on the beds, and that's enough to feed the soil all year, and it keeps the ground happy and reduces work. And this principle of um, no dig, you know, you can apply it to many spheres of activity. So in my bread making, I don't need the bread. So my bread is no need. And, and I think there's a, a lot of jobs where, you know, just look. Like cut out, cut out the, 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 the nonsense. We, uh, I think the people who govern us, you know, this is where I get a bit radical politically, they, <clears throat> they actually want to keep us busy. <laughs> then, then we don't have time to, to question things enough. And um, in, in gardening, I see it all the time. You know, really, gardeners have been given so many unnecessary jobs. Uh, here I'm looking at soil, homemaker soil, just to see what's there, because I don't often dig it, so it's interesting to, to, to dig a hole very instructive, and in this case, that's mostly what I'm, I'm finding at homemakers if I dig a, small, a hole. It's a nice silty loam on top, and at the bottom is quite clay. Clay is great, you know, if you're lucky enough to have clay soil, I would say, you know, just be happy because it holds moisture, it holds nutrients, <clears throat> and with no dig, you haven't got to till it, so there's not that issue. Here again, I'm digging another soil. This was at my previous holding where I was cropping more pure clay, and when I took that field on, it was compacted soil by tractors. I read, compacted soil is quite rare. Gardeners really misuse that word because they, um, they think that firm soil is compact. You know, they would, some of them would call this compacted soil in here because just because it's firm enough that we can walk on it. And it comes from a misconception that soil has to be loose and crumbly to sow and plant into. And that one's been heavily sold, you know, rotivator manufacturers, that kind of thing in the gardening world. Um, a lot of our information is, is filtered through commercial, rather I was suggesting before. At the bottom of this soil, I was so heartened to find 18 inch, 45 centimetre down that, and if you look closely at that soil, it's, it's dense clay, but you can see lots of little round holes, and that's earthworms and other soil organisms working on our behalf. You know, why would we disturb them? They're doing the work, just let them carry on. This, what I was doing in the 80s was slightly different. I was getting free straw from my brother who kept giving it to me. He was uh, um, a chemical farmer then, so he's using fertilizers. And um, I used the straw as path mulch. And initially, I used a hay mulch on the bed. So I'd read the work of Ruth Stout in the US, and she was using hay mulch very successfully. I did that in my first year in 1983. And then I got loads of slugs eating my plants. And I went back to Ruth Stout's book and I said, yeah, well, well, it doesn't say anything about slugs here. This is not fair. It's like, what's going on? It turns out she's in Connecticut, a very dry climate. Uh, you know, she just takes that for granted because it's where she is. So it taught me about applying different methods according to different climates. <clears throat> and and well, I got into compost mulch. So those beds, though, were not receiving a lot of compost. I, in those days, I was putting on about 10 tons an acre of compost. You know, no dig can work with less compost. Uh, the amounts can vary according to what you want to do. I'm using more now because it's more intensive. I want to get high yield per area. And also you get less weeds, actually. We spent more time weeding in those days. I was employing four people at one point. And now it's, well, it's one person partly because I'm doing so many other things and part-time helpers as well. <clears throat> and then this was my 
previous garden where I was cropping an acre, and then I moved to Home Acres in 2013. And this is the my main production is these salad bags. That's photographs taken in December. So we we carry on cropping uh, pretty much right through the year using polytunnel for the new leaves. And we in the autumn I'm growing a lot of things like chicory, radicchio which are fantastic for bulking up salad bags. I love it when I harvest a heart of radicchio because I feel the weight. <laughs> you know, I'm selling by the kilo, obviously. Uh, same with Chinese cabbage. <clears throat> um, because in the autumn, as we daylight diminishes, it's amazing how leaves become much limper and with less weight. So lettuce is great at the moment because it's really chunky and great flavor, but it's not a great salad crop for the autumn. This is how I'm learning more about no dig all the time. I've got two beds side by side. In this photograph, there's the dig bed on the left, so I, I dig it. I still do the digging every December, and I'm putting compost in the trenches, and the no dig bed has the same amount of compost on top. And then same plants going in, same cropping, comparing growth, and it's just fascinating throughout the year, these two beds. I'm really loving this year working with a scientist who's um, helping me to, or she's measuring, <laughs> she's measuring things like carbon in these two beds, <clears throat> and she's been doing it since December. And blow me down, last time I saw her, she comes down about every month or two, and she said, you know, this is getting really interesting. There's a lot more carbon in the no-dig bed. And that's from putting on the same amount of compost. And I've not yet got a figure, but I'm really looking forward to when I've got some results that I can share, uh, you know, with groups like you, for example. Um, because it's, 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 you know, it's scientific information. But nobody, as far as I'm aware, has done this in a systematic way yet. The scientists have not really been looking at what people like me are doing because, guess what, there's not a lot of money in it. You know, who would pay for them? She's doing it as part of her master's research, <coughs> um, which she's partly funding herself, I think, but also through Sarancester University. She also did this little very simple test with cotton cloths in December, which she put in the two beds, the bed I just dug and the no-dig bed where the compost was on top. And then she came back in March and removed these little cotton strips. And that was the result. <laughs> she was blown away there. Uh, you know, this is science. You don't know the result before you start. Um, you find things out and then you work out what's gone on. So what she found was the strips in the no-dig bed had almost disappeared. The cotton had all been eaten by microbes and the strips in the dug soil were mostly intact. You know, that's such a simple thing to do. And, and then to work out, you know, then you need to find out more, oh, what's going on here? I mean, kind of common sense tells you that the microbes are going to be more alive <laughs> if you don't disturb the soil. Uh, and that's what this is showing. So, I mean, any farmer could do this. You know, like if you've got a ploughed field next to a no-till field, uh, try a variation of this little, little experiment and see, see what level of change you're finding. You could try the different depths as well. This is some soil I sent from the dig no dig beds to a microbiologist in Norway who's got a microscope. And she put the dig bed in one, and then she did the no dig. And this is putting the results side by side. So in the dig soil, on the left there, you can see a much more open uh, particles of size all kind of separated. And in the no dig bed, you've got the particles aggregating. I mean, this is soil aggregates. <clears throat> so that's, again, really encouraging to see that. She was, she was blown away by that one. It's like, wow. <laughs> um, so this is yeah, a big advantage of having side-by-side -side beds. And that's how they look quite recently. So the no-dig bed is in front, and the dig bed is behind. And a lot of plantings we find look quite similar. Uh, intriguing variations, like the carrots came up much better. I find that direct sown seeds sown direct, rather, everything else is transplanted there, uh, tend to germinate more strongly where you've got undisturbed soil and some organic matter close to the surface. Like I've never had a problem with getting parsnip seeds to germinate, and I'm always noticing how you know, diggers and allotment uh, people who are diggers are saying how difficult they, they find it. And also the weeds, you know, because we get a lot more weeds on, on the dig bed, not surprisingly. <clears throat> This is how I started out at Homemakers in 2013 winter. And one nice thing about no dig is you can do it in any weather. So you can go out, at least with gardening on this scale, um, applying compost on the surface. And I was using cardboard to kill weeds in the path. 
quite a lot of bindweed, cooch grass, perennial thistles, um, nettles, buttercup in, in this soil. So perennial weeds, uh, I'll do a second application of cardboard on the pathways in this case. I mean, there are many, many ways of doing this. This is just one way. But the principle is smothering the weeds through light deprivation <coughs> so that their parent roots eventually die. <laughs> Question is, how long does that take for, say, cooch grass? I find that by August it was mostly dead, and the bindweed by um, the end of two years <laughs> was mostly dead. So with bindweed, we do the initial march and then the follow-up work with a trowel to lever out the regrowth. And again, the principle there is to tar out the parent root so that it dies in the end. It's that joyful moment you get when, like in this case, uh, September 2014, I suddenly realized, God, there's no more bindweed. <laughs> Time off now. So you've got that um, big hit at the beginning and, and keeping at it and being persistent and, and commitment. I'd liken it to sort of climbing a hill and then you get to the top and then you've got that lovely open space beyond and, and you haven't got to do that repeat work of removing the perennial weeds. We're doing it at the moment in the new ground. You know, it's reminding me what it's like. It's good to be reminded every so often. But in, in my initial quarter acre at Homemakers, cropping is now so easy because we do so little weeding and certainly no more perennial weeds. A little bit around the edges, always trying to come in. We'll keep on that with a trowel. We, we, edging is, is, in gardening terms, you know, that edge is important to maintain. But the middle bit is really easy, and we can just keep cropping, planting, and harvesting. That's the main job. <clears throat> this is actually the new ground where I had no intention to buy this plot of land until about December. I was helped by a friend, Brownie, who gave me the idea. And then, wow, <laughs> by January, I I'd, I'd, I'd bought it, and what am I going to do? I'd, you know, I had no plan. And I walked out there, 15th of January, that was on the left with my scythe, <laughs> I thought, okay, uh, made a start and I scythed a small corner at the edge and then the, three days later we marched that with cardboard and compass. But I hadn't planned ahead, I hadn't got enough compass. I, need, I reckon you need more compass to start than ongoing, so I'm not using massive amounts ongoing, but to begin with this really helps to create beds. Uh, also the edges there, the br brambles are a big job to um, mow them and dig out some of the roots. But this was marching those beds January the 18th, uh, yeah, that was it. And that was only five months ago, and it looks so different now. It's, it's lovely to see the transformation, but it, it kind of felt easy at first, but that's because the bindweed didn't really get growing until April. <laughs> and then once that happened, this was the initial preparation and using wood chip for paths, compost for beds. That's one way. It looks really nice when you do it. In the rest of the ground, actually, we haven't done the wood chip paths. We just put compost on the whole area and covered with black polythene. That's silage polythene from my son, who's a farmer. Uh, but this is, yeah, making those first plantings in, in March. That felt exciting. Uh, but going forwards, yeah, the, the bindweed is kind of governing things a bit now. Because it's, it's not that we can't get rid of it in beds and paths like that, but it just takes so long. So that's, that's how much bindweed there is there. To give you an idea, that was last summer. And that's what it was looking like in February, even under the cardboard or polythene we're putting down it, it it's a two-year job to get rid of it so I've actually covered quite more than half of this ground with black polythene and we're planting through it things like squashes and potatoes so wide space plants that you can you wouldn't you couldn't grow carrots with black polythene but we can grow those larger plantings I mean that's an example of the bindweed I removed from the planting holes that's just from the planting holes of the potatoes uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it, that's ongoing. You know, we can handle it. <laughs> uh, in terms of what you do with that, those perennial weeds, uh, gardeners get given really bad advice. You know, they're they're being driven to fear the whole time. You know, and they're they're really afraid of these perennial weeds uh, roots. For example, they wouldn't put them on the compost heap. Most of them, they've been told not to. But you can, you can compost all of that stuff. We put it all on that and cooch grass, and yeah, bindweed roots like that. <clears throat> they're not invincible, so they decay. On the compost heap, there I'm putting some on. This was back in 2013. I made a cold compost heap as well that winter. It hadn't got hot. And it, it, those roots still all disappeared. You know, it doesn't even have to be a hot compost heap to, to, um, to kill these weeds. So that's bulking up our compost heaps very nicely at the moment, all the bindweed roots. So again, starting out methods, <coughs> I got given some um, wool to try and jute. Wool is interesting. I've just been given a huge dumpy bag of wool by a farmer who can't sell it 
or he, he gets six pound a kilo for his wool or some crazy low price, and so he's kind of giving it away. So like, what, what's the point? And um, <clears throat> what I've been noticing with using wool to mulch is it's pretty high in nitrogen. I, we, by mistake, in, well, just by uh, coincidence, in January this year, uh, we were mulching ground with some cardboard, and some of the cardboard had a hole in it. <coughs> uh, or no, it was polythene on top, that's right. And um, so I'd been, I had some wool packaging from something I'd been sent. So I stuffed wool around um, to fill up that hole in the polythene. And then when we took the polythene off, we planted into that area. And the spinach that we planted where the wool was grew twice or even three times the size. It's just quite remarkable. And then Adam, who works with me, um, he's got an Instagram page, MycoAd, and he took a photo of the soil where he removed the spinach because the spinach was flowering now we replanted with cabbage. And he was noticing all the fungal filaments that he could see in the soil with the wool. So big possibilities, I think, with wool. And we've now done a, just done a huge, well, in my terms, a huge area <laughs> um, for planting cabbage and Brussels into with wool, with this wool I was given, put polythene on top and planting through it into the soil below. But I think as it decays under the polythene, it's, it's going to really add some goodness to the soil. You know, this is finding out new things all the time. That's what I love about this kind of work that we can do as farmers and gardeners. <coughs> you know, we've got all that. Big, this is a big experimental station. We can have fun trying things as well as, you know, producing our crops. And there is a lot to learn. And in this case, I really valued the cardboard box as well that this stuff came in. So that, that was my path mulch. And in, in this growing, I grew potatoes here, um, put compost on the wool and on the jute, and noticed that they, they did grow... Uh, slightly bigger where we had the wool underneath. And this is my method for planting potatoes. People often ask, you know, how do you plant and how do you harvest potatoes as well? You know, it slightly contradicts no dig. And yeah, fair point. But what, what I do is I don't dig a hole for the seed potato. I pull the compost towards me and drop, drop it in. So the top of the seed potato is just below the ground level. And then the potatoes love it. They, they can root into the undisturbed soil. Potatoes root into, like, clay fine, not loosened, you know, it's open, it's got a structure from the roots of weeds or whatever that were in there. And then at harvest time, you are pulling, uh, and that's what you hope to see. So you find the potatoes in the compost or whatever you put on on top. Compost, by the way, can be any decomposed material. So it could be old animal manure, it could be old wood chips, it could be old leaves, it could be compost you buy, like mushroom compost, green waste compost. Uh, so it's anything decomposed, basically. And then the roots of the potatoes are going deeper down into the undisturbed soil, which in this case was clay, in fact. And that was the harvest last year of the potatoes we grew, where this area, not a huge area, 54 kilos, lovely charlotte potatoes that we've only just finished eating, actually. Charlotte is a great variety of potatoes, second early, but it stores really well. So you can harvest it by mid-July. Then you can plant, say, leeks, like we did on the same day that we harvested the potatoes. And then they were just in a paper sack in the barn, and we, we eat them through the winter until May, even. <clears throat> and that's the leeks. So that's the method I use for leeks is multi-sowing. do a lot of multi-sowing. I'll show you that in, in a minute. And they're quick to plant. You haven't got to dig a deep trench. You get a, a pale green stem instead of a pure white one. And the leeks' roots are closer to the surface, so they've got better biology in the soil. This is an example for more for a very small scale where, you know, just make one bed. That did take half a ton of compost, but just planks plunked on grass. Generally, I don't use wooden sides, but in this case, they, they, have, they were serving a purpose to grass all round. Yeah, this is a good method for schools, for example. There are a lot of schools doing this kind of thing now. And the kids love it because, you know, they like playing with compost and then um, <laughs> they can very quickly sow and plant into it. So you can make a bed like that and sow and plant on the same day. You haven't got to wait for the weeds to die and then repeat cropping through several years that's my son Edward on the left doing helping a bit and <clears throat> this was very first year it's interesting to see the carrots grown in compost like this and they generally need that loose compost rather like potatoes to swell in but if you look at the carrots you can see the little root that comes out the bottom of the carrot is clearly in that case going into the old lawn and pasture showing how it's not long before as the weeds die the roots are going down more deeply from the compost layer which they start off in. That's the compost helps them get going, then they root deeper. Mm -hmm. And by the, this stage, the following winter, that you know, the, the soil and compost have become quite a unified whole, if you like. And we just keep planting. And the, <clears throat> putting that much compost on it, it's about 60 litres in this case, 
for a whole year of cropping. It's actually very economical. What I've noticed with my dig, no dig trial, for the same amount of compost on each bed, no dig gives you bigger harvests. So contrary to what's often said, people say, oh, you can't, I can't do no digs, I need a lot of compost. Actually, you need less compost than if you're digging. You, and you're keeping all the carbon in the ground. The same principle with no-till farming. Here, from one application of compost, I got four crops that year. So it was spinach first, then I planted fennel between the spinach, then we twisted out the spinach in May. The fennel carried on growing. Then as the fennel was nearing maturity, I planted French beans under it. So this is interplanting, into sowing where thanks to not cultivating soil, you can grow and you can sow and plant any stage before your previous crop was even finished. So you, you, you know, there's lots more of these combinations to discover. I'm just trying a few here, like under the French beans, I planted winter radish. So the radish was the fourth crop in that space of ground in that calendar year from one application of compost. No feeds or fertilizers, I don't use any of that. <clears throat> you know, I'm organic in all but name. I can't afford to apply for the symbol. I don't need to anyway, but uh, not using any pesticides, weakers. I'm not using any slug pellets, keeping ground clear like this. Um, well, clear, I say, apart from the crops, but not, um, not having many weeds obviously helps. Out. You know, all of that um, old leaves also, we keep our plants really tidy. Now, go through the brassicas, removing the decaying yellow leaves before they land on the ground and harbor the slugs. So on small scale terms, this is how you keep on top of slugs. And I absolutely don't need any slug pellets. And I, even on larger scale, where you're not disturbing the soil, you're not disturbing the ecosystem, if, you know, every time you cultivate a piece of ground, you're killing a lot of beetles, for example, common ground beetle, which eats slugs. It's often said that beetles eat slugs. I'd never seen a beetle eat a slug. Very nicely, though, someone put on Twitter recently an actual video of a beetle doing just that, and it was a bit gruesome, I must say. But it just shows how the, a lot of these things are going on and that we don't realize. And quite often when we're clearing plants, say, or harvesting potatoes, we'll find toads. I think the ground there is full of toads. You don't really see them because they're not, <laughs> they're quite shy creatures, but they eat slugs. Well, so I've been told. <laughs> Someone will probably put up a video of that. So a lot of all these things going on, the, the less we disturb the ecosystem, the better. There's so much is happening for our benefit that we don't, because we don't know it. We don't really appreciate it enough, probably. And likewise, yeah, <laughs> put this in, uh, you know, there, there, there are so many sayings that you hear that are not true. In gardening world, you know, a common one is you should never walk on your bed. People really believe that. Right? And so I always make a point when I'm teaching courses at homemakers, you know, I'll walk on my bed and he's like, oh, are you sure? <laughs> and, and, you know, this is going to be a carrot bed. Or, you know, they, they still go down. It's like, <laughs> actually, I think I've got a picture of that. Yeah, so this is after I sowed carrots and it was dry, uh, even though it's March 22nd. And... I walked on the bed just to firm it down. I, I want the surface always to be firm. Firm is not the same as compact. You've still got the structure underneath. A lovely harvest of carrots. And then the intercropping thing. So in this, with carrots, I found it works so nicely. You plant Brussels sprouts between the carrots. It could be kale or autumn cabbage, but you know, the, an autumn brassica. They overlap really nicely. It's just a question of timings. So they're in the ground for a month while the carrots are finishing. We harvest the carrots around them. And then we get a lovely growth and eventual harvest of Brussels sprouts in the same year that we've had carrots in that piece of ground. And again, without putting on any more compost, carrot, Brussels sprouts in conventional terms are big feeders. I've, I reckon with no, no dig, no till, you don't need to think so much in those terms because you're enabling the soil biology to, to do the work of finding the food. Uh, Elaine Ingham has this amazing statement that no soil in the world does not have enough nutrients already. It's like, what? <laughs> when I heard her say that, it's like, that can't be right. But it's like, her, her line is proved by practice, and she's using compost teas, which is, I think, the way to go for larger areas of ground. We're doing compost because, you know, we're doing higher value crops, <clears throat> benefit from that moisture retention that compost gives you and that kind of thing. But compost teas in a large area will take you into that, uh, the, the principle that she, she's saying, you know, there's nutrients there, you just got to enable the biology <laughs> to make them available. And what we can do on a small scale is putting down compost under the Brussels sprouts in this case. And from keeping the plants tidy, taking off the, the lower leaves, that means we've got space to feed the soil for the coming year ahead. We're not giving the compost for the benefit of the Brussels there. It's for whatever follows them in the year to come. But I, I like to get all my compost on before Christmas, have a bit of time off then partly. But also I know that the soil through the winter, the soil organisms are fed, the soil is covered. Uh, 
sometimes people look at my beds and say, but they're bare in January, February, early March, but they're not. They're covered in compost, they're being fed, and they're ready for the new plantings. Here's another nice um, interplanting, that Swedes with lamb's lettuce. So the Swedes, as they finish, they don't need their lower leaves. So again, we take them off, popping in lamb's lettuce, getting a nice winter harvest alongside or after as well, the Swedes. So it's succession planting. Second cropping is, is with no dig is, is very straightforward. You just need to be a little bit clued up about what you're going to put in next and have the plants ready, the seeds. And that's the annual application of compost, which um, also another one, <laughs> another one I'm doing. I find it with no dig that this, because the soil health is so much stronger, I don't practice a rotation in parts of my garden. And I'm actually running trials, a deliberate trial, where I'm growing broad beans, cabbage, broad beans, cabbage every year. And then in the next bed, I grow potatoes, leeks, potatoes, leeks. I'm now into my seventh year of potatoes in the same ground. They're still healthy. <laughs> you know, I've, I have to check myself doing this. You know, I come from a farming background, and, and organic four-year rotation is preached. It's almost gospel. Although the soil association is slackening a bit now. They've gone down to three, I've heard, in places. <laughs> but, you know, there is an argument there. And some Japanese farmers do it. They're called shume. And, and the way they phrase it, it's so interesting language. They put it the other way around. They call it continuous cropping, which is a virtue. You know, we, we say rotation to avoid pests and disease. You know, we're looking to avoid the negative. They're looking to enhance the positive. It's very much like that with health and disease. I think we've really fallen into a big trap at the moment with COVID. I probably shouldn't say this, but, you know, it's very much focusing on the disease, and there's no interpretation or allowance or interest even in the positive which is health and building health which is happening in this case i feel sort of no till you're building health and so you're not having to worry so much about the disease which is what the rotation is supposed to prevent if it's not there you don't need to rotate but i don't know how long i could keep doing this but all i can say is that now that was fifth year last year was sixth year this is seventh year of doing this same thing and I keep records of the harvest, so they're on my website. If you look under the trials page, um, <clears throat> the one that's called the three strip trial is where I'm doing all these things. And we got all the results there and all the figures of the harvest. And so far, the potatoes have kept very constant at 40 to 48 kilos a year from one strip. And that's the leeks is the, the second planting after the potatoes. And that's very constant between 20 and 28 kilos. Uh, even going forwards, you know, into the sixth year, now seventh. Uh, just a quick little bit about polytunnel cropping uh, <coughs> as a way of enhancing uh, your yields and starting out with, I increased the size of my polytunnel recently. Cardboard compost again, very similar approach. There is some bindweed there. Um, I do intercropping again in the polytunnels. So this was garlic we just harvested again this year. Um, again, no, no worries about rotation there. Uh, I cropped about half the ground with garlic just as an interplant between the salads. It doesn't get in the way of the salad plants. Uh, it's a bonus crop and it grows really big under cover. And then planting the tomatoes, cucumbers, in this case around some garlic still finishing, and using a string, putting string in the bottom of the hole, that anchors it very nicely. It's quite an old practice. Uh, polypropylene baler string, so it's a nice bit of recycling if you've got straw, hay bales. And uh, they're supporting the summer plantings which are not being fed. So I'm not feeding tomatoes, cucumbers, uh, you would need to if you grew them in containers, but you don't need to, I find, if they're in the soil. If you just want a normal crop, that is. You know, we're not going for Guinness Book of Records here. We get a very nice harvest. Um, things like the beef tomatoes going towards the end of the season. And, and then clearing them to plant the winter salads. And it's kind of ironic, really, because I think a lot of people, when they sort of see polytunnel greenhouse, they're thinking in terms of tomatoes and cucumber summer crops. But it's actually the winter plantings that, that make the money. Uh, because you can produce salads in, in the British climate through most of the winter. They really slow down in January, which is nice to have a little bit of time off again. But speed up from mid-February, um, but that's even yeah until April. That, that's the how much gross sale we get. It's not an eye-watering sum in terms of profit, because the amount of labour involved in this is, is high. Uh, I'm actually making quite a small profit on it, but it's a very nice thing to do. You know, It feels like you're fe feeding your community uh, when they most need it in the wintertime. And then those salad plants slowly go to seed through the late spring and or mid to late spring, and we put the compost on for the whole year, plant the summer planting. So compost use, uh, I just put in a, a few pictures to give you some ideas of um, things you can buy uh, and things you can make. And so 
buying the uh, mushroom compost, you can see the difference in color is very interesting. Mushroom compost is much more fungal, not surprisingly. And the green waste compost is more bacterial. They get it up to 80 centigrade. They kill most things in it, actually, at that temperature. Um, but at least you can be sure there's no lingering disease or weed roots or whatever. But I find the biology is very low. When we put it on the ground, I reckon then that's the microbes recolonize it slowly. I wouldn't prefer to use it too much, but it's useful sometimes if you just need bulky organic matter. And this is, you know, a lot of promise in wood chip, I feel. Uh, which is being, being more and more realized now. And if you can age it enough, you, you can get wood chip. I think uh, I've got it in my next picture. Yeah, the um, heap on the right is two years old. And um, that was at Fred's farm up in the Cotswolds. He, he had turned that heap once with a digger. And uh, yeah, it was really nice compost. Uh, this guy also makes hotbeds from wood chip for his propagation. Um, I'm, my composting is smaller scale and it's not always this small, but I do this for gardeners because I'm teaching gardeners so much, um, showing what you can do with just one of those plastic bins. They're difficult to get hot, though. And <clears throat> I do find that you need a, probably at least a cubic meter to get a decent amount of heat if you want that in your compost. And that does help to kill the weed season. The other thing I've done in, more recently since 2016 is having a roof over my heaps. I'd always wanted that and never managed quite to <laughs> achieve it. And that has made so much difference to the quality of compost. You know, if you get serious about composting, if you can keep the rain off, uh, you will find a, a leap upwards in what, the quality of what you grow because it's not, uh, it, it's always aerobic. You know, you haven't got water displacing air. And so we're mixing greens and browns in not too high a proportion of brown, but you want, it's a very hard one to judge because if you do it by weight, you'll have too much green if you do it by vol sorry uh, the other way around uh, weight and volume you just got to practice that one a bit and um, solid size is good there's a lot of myths about making compost you know it's it's a total myth that air flows into a composting oh you wouldn't want that anyway because it would take out your moisture and um, reduce the temperature so I solid size and then we turn it uh, just once I find that one turn is really worthwhile uh, on farm scale that would be possible if you have a suitable device and um, one turn means that you get compost that is higher quality and is quicker to spread so the time it takes us to turn about a ton which is maybe two hours we get back when we're spreading in terms of the quality and the speed of work at that point <clears throat> it's within eight and twelve months old is my compost when spreading and that gives you the details of how much i'm using and some of you farmers will probably be shocked at the amount there but i was giving a talk once at a farming event and uh I thought my talk has been quite well received anyway. Then at lunchtime, these guys came up and said, uh, ah, that's very interesting what you're doing. He said, you know you could be arrested for what you're doing. Probably shouldn't say this actually as well. <laughs> it's like the, uh, because of the misunderstanding between slurry and compost, uh, the, the, the law of how much you're allowed to put on per hectare or acres is, is framed for nitrate soluble applications of fresh slurry, for example. And that's the whole point of this compost. It's the nutrients are not water soluble. Yeah, you know, this is such an important point that regularly gets missed in the farming lecture as well. And there's another point here, which is that if you don't till or don't dig, you've got a much stronger network of microbes in your soil, which can hold on to these nutrients and build you a fantastic larder of food going forwards. They're not going to get washed away. This has also been proven by studies done on like singing frogs farm in California where they, they use a lot of compost but intensive vegetables and they've done tests with stormwater and measuring the, the resulting runoff through their compost, it, almost nothing there, it's very clean. Studies being done have mostly been done on plowed ground where the biology is not there to hold on to these nutrients. But this is, this is more the problem for me and for many Gardeners, at least, I don't know how much it happens on farms, probably less because farmers are growing monocotyledons, so wheat, barley, and maize, which are not affected by this horrible weed killer. The paralid class, aminoparalids, uh, some of you will know these from using them probably. Um, but if you do, I'd urge you please not to sell the resulting produce off your farms because <laughs> if it gets into the composting system, which it seems to, or Farmers then deliver horse manure that's, the horses have eaten the hay that's been, the, the grass has been sprayed with pyrolid weed killers, broadleaf weed killer. This stuff lasts. You know, it's far worse than glyphosate. It hasn't been flagged up enough yet. 
Uh, glyphosate gets quite a lot of bad press. This stuff doesn't really enter the mainstream media much, but a lot of gardeners have been caught out, and market gardeners. You know, I, I get horror stories on Twitter, for example. Someone said that Tracy, she bought 12 ton, no, she spent 12,000 pound on compost to start a new market garden. Unbeknown to her, it had this stuff in. Everything she planted, uh, particularly the soil nation and the legumes, killed. And she's now got poison, so she's lost all her money. What does she do? Nobody actually knows. You know, the people who market-led research, Corteva, Dow, they don't know. They haven't checked this out. You know, they not, they'll put a thing on the label, don't sell this stuff off your farm. Who reads the labels? You know, I'm not blaming anyone here, not in terms of farming, but I do blame Corteva, actually. They know how lethal this stuff is. They should have done more to get a system in place where it doesn't leave the farm where it's been used. And that's what it does to plants. It's a, and people getting this happening, they don't even know. So a lot of this is going on. People are blaming themselves in the gardening world. Uh, it's twisting and distortion of the new um, developing leaves at the top of the plant, not, not curling at the bottom of the plant. It's always at the growing point. It's, it's a very effective weaker. It'll, it'll last for 10 years, and, and it'll go through horses, apparently, without hurting them. I struggle to believe that, but that's what seems to happen. Anyway, to finish on a more joyful note, I'll just say a bit about propagation, because that's so important to certainly um, smaller scale farming, raising plants in small spaces, even using your house. And I make a hotbed actually from horse manure, uh, about a ton, and I'm raising my plants using in the early spring using the heat from that. I'm off grid in the greenhouse, and it's 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 a good system. There's some some small risk of gases from the ammonia when the horse manure is fresh, but apart from that long-term benefit. And then planting plants, transplants small, also works really well, means you're not keeping them for a long time. It makes it cheaper. <laughs> and I've, I've actually had developed a module tray to do this more now. Uh, but we keep a rapid turnover of plants through this quite small area to grow transplants for a whole quarter acre. And then doing some multi-sowing as well. So some some is single seeds pricked out, some is multi-sown. Um, those are singles, like if you want a bigger plant or quicker picking sometimes. but a lot of vegetables like peas, uh, beetroot, onions, they grow really well in clumps. And I was explaining this to a group once, and one of, one of the guys was a really hard-nosed agronomist, and, it, and, and I, I made this lovely statement. I said, you know, plants like growing, going in the ground with their mates. <laughs> and he gave me a funny look. He said, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> but you know, it's this thing of companion planting. It's, it's, it's much more than just that some plants like other plants. I actually think that most plants like most other plants. You know, they, what they like is to be not too far away from other, other seedlings, particularly when they go in the ground. So when you transplant those uh, onions and beetroot, in this case, as a clump, they, they're all there with their friends. You know, actually, they do grow better for it. And you can see how the beetroot are perfectly able to swell and push each other apart. And you get a much higher yield because you're, you're planting more closely. You've got less plant check. You, you know, it's, it's a principle here that can be applied in, in larger scale, I'm sure. Um, plants like each other plants. Uh, this is just to finish. I'm mentioning my online courses. If you want to study this in more detail, which I sell off my website, course one's about no dig, going from weeds to plants very quickly. Course two is growing success, all the, the methods. And then course three probably shouldn't be called course three because you can do it without having done the previous ones. Oh, that's my book and calendar. And um, yeah, course three. Um, I brought along some leaflets. Uh, do, do take one if you want to find out more, and, and I'm happy to take questions. I didn't really check with Joanna, actually, and I've lost all track of time. I don't know how long, how long we've got. Well, it's not like, right. yeah. We've got time for questions. Great. And you have mentioned about this, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, so do yeah. take some leaflets if you want. OK, hands up for questions. I'll go to the back first. Hi, uh, I hope you didn't mention this earlier, but uh, do you make your own uh, compost for propagation and uh, putting in all the modules? Sorry, but what was it exactly? Uh, hi, uh, do you make your own compost for propagation oh, and yeah, putting right, modules? Oh, okay. yeah, right, OK. Yeah, I haven't got enough, actually. And that is a whole new area of expertise. There's a lot of different skills to learn in gardening and farming, and I, that's one that I've not really managed to succeed at yet. <laughs> in a word. So I'm buying in compost. But there's a very good one called Moreland Gold, which I can buy. I use about half a ton a year. Hello. Um, how much compost do you bring in as opposed to homemade? And the other one is about uh, companion planting. Um, do you do it, and how successful are you? OK. Uh, 
I'm buying in about one third. Apart from when, I, when I'm starting new ground, I'll buy in a lot. Uh, but ongoing, we're putting on two, two and a half centimetres, roughly an inch a year, on the beds, not on the paths. And for that, I can make two thirds of what I need, so I need to buy in some more. Uh, and some of that is supplied like, by the horse manure I use my hotbed for, and, that, and potting compost as well. And then a companion planting is, is a bit like I hinted at there. It's, it's about jamming it all in together, really. <laughs> uh, uh, but also, not, it's not specific. It's nothing like as difficult as it's made out to seem. There's so many things that are made sound difficult and precise, and you have to know. Actually, like I say, most plants like most other plants. I'll put up photos on Instagram of fennel growing next to lettuce, say. A number of comments are, oh, I've been told that fennel doesn't like other plants, you know. Um, but clearly, you can see from the photo that they're both very happy with each other's company. And so it's that principle of just keeping things close and interplanting, into sowing, uh, And also dotting a few flowers amongst your vegetables is always really nice, just looks nice. It's nice for us as well. Hi there. Um, we have an issue with weed pressure along edges, so the edges of the beds, particularly along the polytunnel and things. Do you have any advice for edges and how you can avoid weed pressure? Yeah, very much. Well, do you, do you mow them? <laughs> oh, right, okay. Well, that's, that would be my number one advice. We do actually, it, it, just simple ride on mower, just whiz round, keep it tight. Because, you know, that whole thing of um, long, when you, when, you, when you graze less intensively and the grass gets longer, um, the roots get stronger. It's, it's that principle in reverse. So you want to keep it really mown tight to reduce the strength of the invading root system. And then a long handle shears along the edge. What about the, what, what about the, the polytunnel? Oh, well, they, they shouldn't be spreading into your polytunnel, are they? You haven't, you haven't got polythene down to the ground. Yeah, polythene, but then the weeds really come at the edge and can't along it. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I've, I've now... Um, I mulch my edge with cardboard in the end, and, and I grow flowers around the edge. But I, that does take a certain amount of time. Looks really nice. But, but previously, when I had grass, we were mowing as close as we dared, and then we would just go along and pull it out, actually. Yeah, there's a certain amount of labor-intensive work here I don't think you can avoid. Hi. Um, taken over an allotment, um, and uh, uh, taken over an allotment, and there's um, rocket, wild rocket everywhere embedded. We've tried digging some of it out, probably not the best thing, but uh, with the summer coming, we can't mulch. Uh, what would you recommend mulching? We're trying to plant into the sort of very dense soil. I don't, don't want to say impacted now. You, you, you want to start cropping straight away, planting? Well, we have to, because we get kicked off if we don't. There's a 10 year waiting list of these allotments. <laughs> <laughs> we, okay. we were warned we had to improve, we had to till. Yes. Yeah, we to, uh, it's weird on a lot of it sometimes. Okay, we so. We had to plant everything. But it, it's, it's, couldn't you, you can't just keep twisting them out, because that's why I, I use a sharp trowel to remove wild rocket while I'm twisting at the same time. Good, that, that could work for you. I don't think there's any remedy to, apart from doing that if you want to just literally get rid of it. I mean, sometimes there is quite a bit of manual labour, but if you're using like, the trowel at the same time as twisting, we always twist rather than pull, and that snaps off most of the root system which stays in the ground, which is what you want. And whenever you're clearing plants, you want to keep the roots in there as much as possible. And just do that before plant planting, not to try and plant amongst the carpet or Yeah, well, no, I don't know any other way if you want to get in there straight away. Otherwise, you could use black polythene or carpet and compost. That will work. It's not an invincible plant, but it probably needs about two months of darkness. And it's actually interesting, when you put uh, mulches like carbol polythene on plants which are trying to grow strongly, like it is at the moment, it dies more quickly because it uses up the energy of its root system. You know, within, say, two months, I reckon you'd be clear. It's whether your committee would allow that. Sheep roll. <laughs> Where exactly should I put it straight on a soil under like you have a grass, you put sheep wool and then a compost on the top, or cardboard, compost, sheep wool, black, black plastic, uh, or sheep wool just on the paths between, because I have the same issue, not issue, I have a benefit of a plenty of sheep wool. You've got loads of wool, <laughs> yeah, okay. But uh, yeah, I would use it only either with, if you're putting it on weeds, you need a, the cardboard and the compost as well. It won't smother the weeds of itself, they will grow through it. So pathways, likewise, if you're past clear of weeds at the moment, it could be an interesting march. I don't know if it might be slippery when it gets wet, that kind of thing. But 
<laughs> we'll see. It's try it and see, honestly. It's so lucky it is with a lot of these things because these methods are quite new, you know, and, and, and access to materials. Like in, in the past, sheep's wool would have been valuable, and people would not have done this, but we need to find out how to use it. Where you was having the sheep's wool when you said the spirit was growing, was it under the ground? Yeah, well, we've got a lot of bindweed there. So what we do is we put the sheep wool, we put compost on, then we put sheep wool on top, then we put the polythene cover back, and then we're making small holes to plant kale and... Yeah, yeah, still visible. But then it degrades quite fast. It actually degrades more quickly on the surface with more microbes. Hi, um, over here. <clears throat> I can't see you. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. Hi. I'm in the, in the subtle shirt. Um, I was interested in you talking about making the compost from pure wood chip. That obviously is a lot of carbon in there. Does it need hmm. any nitrogen adding as well to balance it out, or does it work okay plain? Question of time. If, if you allow it enough time... Um, it will break down into yeah, a carbon-rich compost. But if you, you can speed it up by adding grass mowings, for example, any green leaves. Uh, but I think that the final result is not that different because um, the wood is picking up uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria from the air and, and you know, building itself into compost that way. So. Uh, thinking about the need to protect soil surfaces from heat increasingly, and uh, what's the use of uh, dried uh, garden clippings, grass clippings? Helpful, not helpful, as a mulch material? Uh, grass clippings? Hmm. Yeah, as long as you just don't encourage slugs, I would say that's... Don't encourage... Slugs, <laughs> mollusks, and, and also whether it might have weed seeds or not. I mean, the, the beauty of using compost, that, especially if it's got hot, is just total weed-free. We find we can manage that. And, and it, that frees you up so much. So, yeah. Uh, just sort of, <laughs> I thought of something about the wood chip question, actually. If the wood chips are green, you know, because the wood chips is, is the only word we have, but it covers a whole spectrum of possibilities. And if, it's, if you were, like, cutting new growth this year from an elder, for example, I would call that green wood, and it's got quite a bit of green matter in, and that will decompose much more quickly than chippings of older wood, for example. We're using green compost across the garden, but one of the problems we've had is with this dry weather that it dries out very quickly. Mm -hmm. So you're back there with the sprinkler and trying to water it. Is there anything we can do to, you know, compared to the way we used to do it, which is where you're saying don't do, you know, that we're losing moisture from that green? What, what exactly compost. is the compost you're using there? Well, it's a mixture of um, brown and green, you know, and it's. Your own left, homemade? Yes, left oh, okay. in, left in a, a pit, and, you know, it, worms come and look wonderful in it and then we put it on the ground and it goes quite dry it well, seems I'm intrigued that it does that what time of year are you putting it on the ground uh early spring and then planting into it you know late ah, spring it might be that then uh, uh, that's the advantage i think of putting it on in the early winter rather than early spring it hasn't had time to kind of be eaten by soil organisms and get integrated more into the soil okay. which will help to conserve the moisture because we really don't find that with homemade compost but i have noticed it where the compost has gone on a bit later in the season it sits on top yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it on at Christmas or before Christmas. And that, that's the advantage also of applying it underneath things. You, 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 know, might, you might still have plantings there, but you can put it under your broccoli, your purple sprouting broccoli, for example. You put it on in December. Hi. Um, where do you buy your seeds from? <laughs> that's a very good question. And going forward, it's going to get more difficult with Brexit. But um, I, there's a company in Germany I really liked and appreciated called Bingenheim because they do very good maintenance of varieties and they're organic and often biodynamic as well. But I don't know if I'm going to have access to or be able to buy their seeds. But there's a company called Seed Co-op in Lincolnshire who are actually also biodynamic. They've got a 20 acre greenhouse and they import some seeds from Bingenheim. I hope they'll be able to carry on. That's definitely my favourites. Because what I'm noticing with garden seed companies and a lot of seed producers now, they are not maintaining the varieties. So they're giving contracts to farmers to grow the seed, like in Italy, beetroot, for example, and they're not giving them enough money that they can rogue the beetroot they're growing to pull out the misshapen ones or the funny colored ones. And so the seed that's being sold now is losing quality. And there's so many examples of that, like Boltardi beetroot, uh, a lot of varieties of purple sprouting broccoli, gardeners delight tomato. Some of you might remember that if you're old enough from the 1980s like me, and it used to be the epitome of a cherry tomato small dark red skin, uh, very thin skin, and really sweet. And now you buy the seed with the same name, Gardener's Delight, it's not that at all. It's bigger, paler, not sweet anymore. So that's just an example of the things you've got to watch out for. But if you can get find a good seed company doing good seed selection in their growing, 
<laughs> follow them. Uh, thank you very much for, um, for this. It's some magic. Um, I just wondered how you sell your stuff. Uh, well, to local shops, I do a few boxes. I'm not big enough, really, to have a CSA. Uh, we use quite a bit at Homemakers for courses being run there. And um, do you know, I give quite a bit away, actually, <laughs> because I'm really quite disillusioned with the low prices of agricultural uh, or horticultural produce. And because I'm doing more other work now that's better paid, it's incredible disparity between what I can earn teaching compared to market gardening. Um, I actually give quite a bit away. <laughs> so it's not easy to make a living selling produce. But there's one local spa, actually. He takes a lot bagged, and two local restaurants take a lot. That helps. <clears throat> Hello. We made a small uh, potato field this year with undisturbed compost. And then in the top, we have a mixture of hay and compost. And it came up really differently, the potatoes. So I don't know if the layer, how thick would you say it should be if you have a layer on top of the potato and the compost? OK, I didn't quite get all that. But you put, put two compost, different things, was it? Yeah. put compost in the, the bottom and then the potatoes, yeah. like you did. And then we put a, a layer. I think it, came, uh, it became quite uneven, but it's some places maybe 5, 10 centimeters, some places maybe 20, 30 centimeters, because it's a big area where we spread it out. So the potatoes came up really differently. Some are really small of the plants right now, some are really big. But the layer is a mixture of hay and compost. <laughs> well, it's really hard to say, but it sounds to me like you might even have used more compost than you need. I mean, that's a huge amount you put on. I'm never using more than 15 centimeters initially, and in subsequent years, three, say. Uh, the, the, bottom is maybe, sorry, the bottom is maybe like 15 centimeters. Okay. But then the top layer to kind of keep it there is quite uneven, but how much would you put on the top? You talked about like different things you would put on the top to keep it there. I, you know, I'm not too sure, to be honest. I, I'm afraid I didn't really quite understand that. I feel free to come up and ask me afterwards if you yeah. want more details. I think that's an idea. Um, there's one question here, and then this is the last one. Okay, Charles. <laughs> Hello again, Charles. Um, talking about temperatures of compost, uh, what temperature are you looking to get to to kill the weed seeds, but then if that temperature increases, at what point are we killing off the biology within the compost? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Uh, well, 55 kills weed seeds, that's generally recognized on average, and 70 centigrade is where you start to lose, above that you start to lose the fungi. And that green waste compost I mentioned, which they get to 80, <laughs> that's why they haven't got much of the interesting fungi in there. But it's not easy to maintain a, a homemade compost heap in that temperature range because you know we can't control always what we're putting in we're putting in what becomes available and in the summer that's why it's really good to have a store of brown materials like last year's wood chip whatever uh, to add as a brown because we're putting in a lot of green at the moment and that can reduce the heat stop it getting too hot and we found what works really well is if you get at least six month old wood chip put it on the ground in the thin layer and run the lawnmower over the top that chops it up nicely and you get a kind of brown powder which decomposes more quickly with all the green